Okay, uh, I think we should be good to go. Would someone like to unmute and tell me that we are in fact good to go? You can hear me, you're seeing the right screen. Yes, all is good. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center Integrative Diagnostic Medicine Case Conference for June 11th. Very excited that you are here. Okay, without further ado, let's, let's get into it. Uh, I want to start with uh, molecular signature instant pattern recognition. So here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to show you a molecular signature, and I would like for someone, quick as you can, as soon as you know or think you know, unmute and give me a diagnosis. Now, there's always, there's always a differential diagnosis for virtually everything. So what I would like is for you to give me what is number one, on your differential diagnosis list. That's what I mean when I say give me a diagnosis, right? And there's no tricks here. I, this is going to be a primary brain tumor. It's not gonna be a melanoma or a metastatic course or something like that, right? Everybody understand? Okay, ready to play? Let's do it. What's a diagnosis? I've got all day. Uh, oligodendroglioma. Yes, good job, oligodendroglioma. Look, what we have here is an IDH1 mutation and a TERT promoter mutation. All right, you might you might say, wait, TERT promoter mutation, isn't that a IDH wild type glioblastoma? No, because there's an IDH mutation. Well, so IDH mutation, well, uh, isn't it therefore an IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma? No, because IDH mutant diffuse astrocytomas do not have TERT promoter mutations. What do the majority, not all, but what do the majority of IDH mutant diffuse astrocytomas also have? What would you see? You would see TP53 circled, and sometimes you'll see ATRX circled. There are multiple mechanisms for losing ATRX expression mutations, one of them, but that is the classic triad, so that would be IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma. So the combination, the combination of a TERP promoter mutation and an IDH mutation that is screaming oligodendroglioma number one on your list good job all right this is actually this was a beautiful classic case of oligo in virtually all eight venn diagram spheres the data spheres right the model uh let's have a look uh here's the imaging what you see on the far left uh is a t2 and then the uh, the t2 flare there is no t2 flare mismatch um and you can see especially on the t2 uh heterogeneous texture Heterogeneous texture refers to the varying intensities on T2 and T2 flare. That's very characteristic of oligo. It's a little bit fuzzy, maybe on the bottom part. Could be fuzzier. I would like for it to be a little fuzzier. That is a characteristic of oligo versus IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma. And the far right panel is just an axial T1 with contrast showing that it is a non-enhancing tumor. Now, I want to look at this. This is the FISH result the fish result for 1P19Q analysis. And let's look at the let's look at the ratios. This is absolutely perfect and this is what you want to see. So the average 1P36 signals per nucleus of 1.08, average 1P 1Q25, 2.04. So the ratio 1P to 1Q is just about 50%. Same thing if you look at 19Q versus 19P, all right, and the ratio again, 0.51. Now, when you look, when you're, when you're looking at the FISH results, all right, and, and the differential diagnosis is oligo versus astro, right, and you're looking to determine is there co-deletion or not, there can be false positives. One of the clues that it's a false, false that is a false positive for co-deletion is if you look at the ratios 1p to 1q and 19q to 19p, and that the actual percent varies significantly. That is a clue that's probably a false a false positive. All right. See how close these are. An example, 1P to 1Q might be just like this, 0 0.52. One, 19Q to 19P might be 0 0.70. And maybe the cutoff in a particular laboratory because, you know, it's paraffin sections cut and all that. Maybe it's 0.75. So, you know, it, it qualifies technically, you know, for, for being a, a deletion. But that varying ratio, you should not see that. The two ratios should be close together. It doesn't have to be 0 0.5. I mean, th this is a beautiful, perfect result. It could be 0 0.61, 0 0.63, et cetera. But they're very close together. Every, everyone understand that? That's just a little trick, if you will, for spotting for spotting false positives when you didn't expect it. So maybe maybe the, the, the tumor was very pleomorphic, you know, and you're not expecting oligo, and all of a sudden the fish report comes back and it says positive for co-deletion. Look at the data. Look at the data. Maybe it was a bad call. Maybe it's close, really close to the cutoffs. Maybe those ratios vary. Everyone got that? Okay. 
Uh, look at the histology, beautiful histology for oligo, very monotonous, round, regular uh, nuclei, surrounded by perinuclear halo, which is just cytoplasmic vacuolization in FFPE sections. Uh, as we said many times uh, in this conference, all, the, all of the uh, oncologic surgical pathologists know that a frozen section, you will not see the halos, and furthermore, the, fro the freezing process distorts the nuclei, single most common uh, disparity between intraoperative consultation, i.e. frozen section, and FFPE permanent diagnosis, final diagnosis, is calling oligoastro at frozen because the freezing process distorts the nuclei. It makes, it makes gorgeous oligos look like astrocytomas. You go down the garden path at frozen, you call it diffuse astrocytoma, and then the FFPE sections come out the next day and it's a, it's a gorgeous oligo and it's confirmed on, on, on molecular. Good diagnosis to make at frozen, diffuse glioma. All right, there we go. And this is just, a, this was a, this is white matter. Uh, here's gray matter. And if you see gray matter, uh, you can recognize it as cortex, and you see all these clusters, linear and spherical, and those are the secondary structures of shear. That's perineuronal and perivascular satellitosis. Now, look, look how much open neuropil there is in this particular case. Sometimes the cortex can be as solid as the white matter. In this particular case, um, most of the cells that are infiltrating the cortex or around neurons and around vessels. All right, that's what um, H.J. Shearer, <laughs> who published the paper, The Shearer Structures, he called that precocious secondary structures. Precocious, meaning that early on, all of the tumor cells infiltrating cortex are, in, uh, are surrounding neurons and surrounding vessels with very few cells percolating through the parenchyma. It's a fascinating thing, isn't it? Um, you will see it. You will see it. It's not very common, I can tell you, but you will, you will see examples. This is getting close, all right? Uh, molecular, here it is, IDH1R132H, remarkable antibody. It essentially, uh, here, here's the thing. The protein, the mutant protein, is expressed in 100% of the glioma cells. We have a wonderful commercially available antibody, which is very robust once you have it titrated properly, et cetera, and that is a remarkable thing, basically 100% expression, extremely powerful when it's present. Here's what we expect for oligodendroglioma, ATRX, we expect it not to be lost by any mechanism, so this is what you see, and notice the, uh, the capillary. See the endothelial cells elongated? When you sit, when a marker is positive, listen, when a marker is positive in endothelial cells, other vascular elements, uh, that indicates that the antibody is directed against a normal, a normal epitope. That's one of the ways that you tell the difference between antibodies which are uh, directed against mutant proteins like IDH1 or 132H and those directed against normal and then like, like, uh, like AT, ATRX. It's amazing how in this era of molecular oncologic neuropathology, many of the surgical pathologists do not understand that, and they confuse them, they get them backwards, they use vague language. Ambiguity is never your friend in a surgical pathology report, in a radiology report. Okay, and here's a P53. Absolutely, you can see scattered staining nuclei. Sometimes it's stone cold negative. You can definitely see uh, staining nuclei. I think I call this 5%. Five, five That's fine. Uh, only when it you know, gets up higher percentages uh, is indicative of, of a TP53 mutation, but this is very common. This is very good for oligo, and here's the final diagnosis. For this case, oligodendroglioma, IDH mutant 1P19Q cotyledon, up to grade 2. Why grade 2? Well, loosely based on the mitotic activity, fewer than one mitosis, 10 high power fields. The MIBs a little elevated, 10%. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you get a little bit of discrepancy. Grading is not based on the KI67. Uh, and as, as we said many times before, grade 2 versus grade 3 in oligos and in diffuse astrocytomas, IDH mutant is very subjective. There's a big gray zone in the middle where you're flipping a coin. Hopefully it will disappear because the molecular signature, whether it's IDH mutant or not for diffuse astrocytomas is more powerful than classical histologic grading by mitotic figures. And one of the, the evidence, we, we see this virtually virtually every other week. We, we, we will have a new patient coming through, all right, uh, coming to MD Anderson for the first time with a 20-year history of anaplastic astrocytoma. It was IDH mutant, and it was based on the mitotic activity 20 years ago, and they still have not progressed to a, to a, to a grade four. All right, that sort of proves the point of, of how fallible, how weak uh, grading is, um, you know, by, by, by the classical features for 
oligodendrogliomas and for IDH mutant diffuse astrocytomas, but it's still with us and it still will be with us uh, for some time, so we're going we're gonna to live with it. Okay, let's move on. Uh, immunomarker of the week. I do this sometimes, highlight a marker. All right, we always put it in the context of, uh, of, of reality. Uh, someone unmute and give me the diagnosis for this case. And again, as always, what I mean is what's number one on your differential diagnosis list? Someone tell me what this tumor is. No one wants to unmute? No one wants to talk? <laughs> Are we still live? D does no one recognize butterfly glioblastoma? <laughs> Maybe not. Lymphoma, primary CNS diffuse large B cell lymphoma can be, can look like this, but it would be solid enhancement in the elder, elderly population, not with all the central necrosis. So this is a butterfly glioblastoma. All right, and here's the histology. And I'm not sure if you can appreciate, if you look very closely, there's a very high percentage of gametocytes uh, here with the globular eosinophilic cytoplasm. That's the histology of this particular glioblastoma. There was microvascular proliferation, there was necrosis, uh, et cetera. All right, this is the context. Now, here is the immunomarker of the week. Anyone want to unmute and tell me what you think this marker is? It's lighting up the gametocytes. See all the spherical, uh, posit uh, spherical uh, bodies that are positive? Those are the gametocytes labeling strongly with the antibody of the wheat. Somebody unmute and, and take a shot at it. Morning, Greg. This is Ann. Um, I haven't had my tea yet, but I'm assuming it's like GFAP or something. Yes, thank, thank you. That's perfect. All right. That's it. Thank you. And thank you for your bravery. <laughs> okay, so here, here's, this is the GFAP on this case. All right, and you can see it's, it looks virtually identical, right, highlighting the gametocytes. Okay, this is not GFAP, right, because I wouldn't do that. I, would not, I wouldn't highlight, you know, if, if it's like test-taking strategy, you know what I'm saying? And there's no way in this conference, in this conference, that I'm going to show you GFAP and let's talk about GFAP. Probably not, right? Because because that that's 101, and this conference is 401, right? So you got to hit the ground with your feet moving in in this conference, right? All right. So someone unmute and tell me what is this marker which is staining beautifully all of these gametocytic neoplastic uh, cells just like GFAP in an identical pattern to GFAP, cytoplasmic only, no nuclear staining. All right. It's identical to GFAP. What's the marker? Anyone want to take a shot? I'm sorry, say again? S100? I don't know. Uh, no, S100, S100 would stain the nuclei also. S100 in gliomas stains nuclei and cytoplasm. Um, most, most tumors that express S100, it will be nucleus and cytoplasmic. The one exception to that frequently is chordoma. Chordoma often, with many of the S100 clones that are used, it will be cytoplasmic only, not nuclear, that's fine. But for gliomas, that's, a, that's one of the clues uh, how to differentiate S100 from GFAP is look at the nuclei. If the nuclei are not stained, it's probably going to be S100, all right? If they are stained, then, yeah, uh, it's not going to be GFAP if the nuclei are stained, unless it's a technically horrible stain, right? Okay, so anyone want to unmute and take a, take a second shot? So I'm, it's not GFAP. It's not S100. What is it? So a few people in the chat, Greg, have said uh, someone offered IDH. There's pan-keratin and oleg-2 have been. Perfect. I love that. Oleg-2 is a nuclear stain, so it's not oleg-2. This is the opposite of oleg-2, but that, that, was a, that was a great guess. This is AE1, AE3 pan-keratin. And thank, thank you for letting me know what's going in the chat, because I can't see the chat. I don't have it set up. So maybe when you, when you see interesting things in the chat, if you could do exactly what you're doing and unmute and, and let me know, and we'll address it. Thank you. All right. Yeah, this is AE1, AE3. Now, listen, the reason why I am presenting this yet once again in this conference is it happened again this past week where, you know, on the outside, it's like, what is going on with this case? We thought it was a glioma, keratin staining, can't eliminate metastatic carcinoma, right? And so I think it's worth, it, it's, it's, it's worth presenting. If any of the surgical pathologists, trainees, fellows, residents that are attending, certainly any of our, our, our uh, oncologic neuropathology fellows, neuropathology fellows, uh, probably already know this, but if even one person in this audience does not know it, <laughs> we're going to review it super quickly right here. All right, let's go back 30, 30 years ago. American Journal of Surgical Pathology, 1989. Intermediate filament expression uh, uh, in astrocytic neoplasms, 30, 30 astrocytomas. AE1 and AE3 was demonstrated in 80% 
including 66% of well differentiated, 83% of anaplastic astros, and 83% of glioblastomas. This was known 30 years ago. All right, fast forward to 20, <laughs> 20 years ago, and uh, the awesome Richard Prayson at Cleveland Clinic, um, all glioblastoma stain for GFAP, all but one, that is 96% stain positive for cytokeratins AE1, AE3. Only focal re reactivity was observed in a single case with CAM 5.2, which was which in this series was 4.3%. Okay, listen, listen, <laughs> listen up. We're going to recommend in just a second, CAM 5.2 is going to be one of the big ones that we use. Okay, yesterday, yesterday, Myself um, and, and our current oncologic neuropathology uh, fellow, Dr. Ashley Holloman, we had a case from the outside that was focally strongly positive for CAM 5.2 in a glioblastoma. It absolutely does occur, but it's only, what is this, 4%, call it, versus with AE1, AE3, 96%, right? Uh, if you keep reading, you'll see that immunoreactivity for um, the BER-EP4 was not observed. That's, a, that's, another, that's another good one. We don't, we don't use it here, but that, that would be a much better alternative. All right, listen, look at the conclusions. Based on the aforementioned results, a combination of immunostains, including GFAP and cytokeratin uh, CAM 5.2, may be the most useful in differentiating poorly differentiating metastatic carcinoma glioblastoma. A significant number of GBM stain with some keratin, cytokeratin markers, in particular cytokeratins AE1 and AE3, because it's a mixture of AE1 and AE3. Because of the poor specificity of cytokeratins AE1 and AE3 in distinguishing metastatic carcinoma glioblastoma, it should not be used to differentiate the two, the two entities. But guess what? Listen, I mean, this is what this knowledge is 30 years old, over 30 years old, <laughs> over a quarter century old. Now, every week, honestly, listen, every week we receive cases coming in from the outside, patients coming to MD Anderson Cancer Center, where the general surgical pathologists and community hospitals used AE1, AE3 to try to differentiate glioblastoma from metastatic carcinoma. How can that happen? It's got to be in the training programs. Or, or, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, okay, uh, it's not just the literature. Look at this, DACO, the antibody company. This is, this is their little newsletter, 2003, AE1, AE3 as a marker for human and mouse astrocytes. Look at those beautiful reactive astrocytes. Basically what the article says is everyone knows that AE1, AE3 cross-reacts with a high percentage of glial tumors. And it's all glial tumors, by the way. It's not just astrocytomas, not just glioblastoma. It's pendomomas, even schwannomas even schwannomas. All right, we'll show it. All glial tumors can show expression of AE1, AE3. Everybody got that? If you didn't, if you didn't know that, they're saying, guess what? Reactive astrocytes, also you can use it. So DACO, listen, DACO is marketing, they're marketing AE1, AE3 as a glial marker, and you're going to use it to try to separate a glial tumor from carcinoma? Seriously? All right, how about this? Uh, the PATH group, ProPath, Pro this is their, their newsletter magazine, The Focus, 2003, and featured antibodies, cytokeratin AE1, AE3. The other interesting feature of cytokeratin AE1, AE3 is that it typically stains glial tumors strongly. In fact, one could argue that it is appropriate to avoid using cytokeratin AE1, AE3 in this context. Yeah. Okay, all right, let, let, let's move on. Listen, listen, everyone in this audience, all you guys, all you guys are now ambassadors. You are ambassadors to spread this knowledge, spread the wisdom. And look, it's going to make it fun for you. If you did not know this, and you, you say, say you're a surgical pathology uh, a fellow or resident, watch for it. Watch for it in the cases coming through, right? Now, many in many instances, it will be stone cold negative. They got lucky, right? In, in a glioblastoma, AE1, AE3, stone cold negative. Absolutely, it may not actually be as high as 80%, all of that. But the cases will come through, many of them frequently, where you see focal, strong, unequivocal. Look in the microscopic if the report has microscopic, and see how the pathologist handled that. Did they just call it negative? Did they call it background? Or did they, were they honest and said focally positive? It's really interesting to see. All right, let's bring it to a conclusion. For the commonly encountered differential diagnosis of metastatic carcinoma versus glioblastoma, this is going to be in small, cauterized <laughs> specimens, a uh, lot of necrosis. The other, the other entity in the differential is, it, it might be lymph lymphoma, all right, and melanoma, right? Those are the big four. Listen, imagine stereotactic biopsy, 50% necrotic tumor, ugly cells, mitotic figures, always going to be GFAP positive because there's going to be reactive astrocytes. What are the markers that you use to separate glioblastoma from metastatic carcinoma, from metastatic melanoma, from metastatic or primary diffuse large V-cell lymphoma. 
All right. Well, for the, what we're addressing here is don't use AE1, AE3 as the marker, or you're, you may go down the road and call it metastatic carcinoma. Instead, better choices, CAM 5.2, absolutely, or you can use Keratin's 818, all right, the, the cocktails, is a, or Oscar. Oscar is actually a, a very good alternative to AE1, AE3. It has virtually an identical broad spectrum, low molecular weight, high molecular weight, Keratin specificity, but a very, this is just fortuitous, fortuitous uh, that it has very little, very low, like CAM 0.2, cross-reactivity with gliomas. Everybody like that? Okay, moving on. H and &E image of the week, and here it is. Is that not magnificent or what? Anyone want to unmute and give me a diagnosis? What do you think the diagnosis was in this case, and and explain it? Okay, here's some help. I'll show you the pre-op imaging. What's the diagnosis and why? No one recognizes what's in this blood vessel. It's a glioblastoma IDH wild type. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Yes, that's it. This is an intravascular fibrin microthrombus, which is highly associated with IDH wild type genotype in glioblastoma, as opposed to IDH mutant grade 4 diffuse astrocytoma, which tend not to have uh, intravascular fibrin thrombi. Why? Well, we have to go. This is a classic paper by the legendary Craig Horbinski. Um, 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 and, and you can the, the other two uh, famous neuropathologists here, you see David Zagzag was at fourth from the end, and Mattia Snooderl, uh, both at N, N, NYU. Uh, David Zagzag and I took the neuropathology boards together. All right, so here we go. And then and, and, uh, Craig Horbinski is now at uh, North, Northwestern with Dan Bratt. All right, here's the conclusion. Our data suggests that mutant IDH1 it has potent anti-thrombotic activity within gliomas and throughout the peripheral circulation. In other words, and that's why you tend not to see DVTs in IDH mutant grade 4 disease, also known in the past as glioblastoma IDH mutant, but it is very common, the thrombi are very common in IDH wild type because they do not have the anti-thrombotic activity of the mutant IDH. Isn't that cool? All right. Now, I, I, for, uh, for forever, forever and ever, I remember, oh, it's probably, well, I guess it probably was about 28 years ago when uh, Dr. Raymond Sawaya, uh, the, the, the former chair, uh, a founding chair of the Department of Neurosurgery at MD Anderson Cancer Center, um, uh, t t told me, he, I knew, he said, I knew it was going to be glioblastoma because of the thrombosed vessels right, on the surface as we go in. And we see the same thing histologically um, um, in, in the IDH wild type of glioblastomas, these microthrombi also we see. It's not 100%, it's not pathognomonic, it's supported. All right, now in this particular case that I just showed you, that image that it came from, uh, here's the report, glioblastoma NOS, because we, we did not have, we do not have uh, IDH data, not even the antibody, nothing, nothing even runs, case coming in, as you can see, from the outside, all right, but in my comment, the presence of prominent intravascular fibrin microthrombi favor IDH wild type genotype, so that would help in a pinch, in a pinch, that is going to help the neuro-oncologist and radiation oncologist plan the treatment for this patient until such time as testing can be performed, right, so it's like giving them a heads up, all right, this is this Gorgeous. It's staining particularly intensely. That's why it's the histologic image of the week. Certainly, it's not the only one. Same case. Now, here's a cluster of two vessels of thrombi, and it's not 100%. The two vessels on the left, those are red blood cells. There's no thrombus. There's the thrombus, the one, the one on the right. Uh, it's simply when they are prominent, when they are prominent, when you notice them here, 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 it's suggesting that there is no IDH1 antithrombotic activity in this tumor. Everybody got that? Now, look, see, maybe you knew, maybe you knew that uh, intravascular fibrin thrombi, microthrombi, are associated with IDH1 genotype, but you didn't understand why. Now you know why. It's probably working through a calcium mechanism. You can read Dr. Horbinski's paper. I think he had a follow-up paper uh, on that. Okay, let's move moving on. Uh, vision test of the week. <laughs> okay, I co-opted this. I co-opted it. I totally stole it from Dr. Pedro Diaz Martian. He calls us eye test. So in his in his wonderful conference, weekly conference, uh, he he'll do these things he calls eye test, and it's basically can you spot it? It's it's eye for detail, eye for detail, or are you sloppy? <laughs> 
and you don't want any detail. You want to have arrows and circles and annotations, right? Pathologists, radiologists, etc. All right. So this is, I'm going to call this a vision test. All right. Every, everyone ready? Dr. Diaz, I, I, I should say, is the, the chief neuropathologist at Bentop Hospital and director of the Baylor College of Medicine um, Radiology Residency and Neuroradiology Fellowship. All right. A very experienced, amazing oncologic neuroradiologist. All right. I'm going to show you an image. This is a vision test. Everyone is eligible. Everyone is eligible, including the, if we, uh, I don't know if Octavio's on, uh, et cetera, any, any, any of the neuroradiologists, you're eligible, all right? I want someone to unmute and give me the diagnosis. Are you ready? Here we go. What's the diagnosis? Anyone? No? I'm going to give it a little uh, No, no, that, 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 that was a, that's, a, that's, a, that's close, but not quite. So this is a T1 with contrast, and you can see, here we go, you can see the pituitary is lighting up, but there is what we call hypo-enhancing. There is a hypo-enhancing focus within the pituitary. This is a pituitary microadenoma. Now, look, here's the thing. This is a sagittal section. Normally, we're used to seeing this uh, on, on a coronal. I mean, that's usually the way it's depicted. That's I always I always look at the at the coronals, and the coronals are usually where you pick it up, and it's easiest on the coronal court to tell if it's the right or the left, right or the left side. I just thought this one was one of the rare instances where it was beautifully conspicuous on the sagittal, the mid sagittal, and I thought that this would be a great. Uh, uh, example to show because it's not it's not the plane that you're used to but see you you have to be able to do that you have to be able to generalize right that's what that's what the human brain does as opposed to lower mammals and lower mammals can become really good at all sorts of manual tasks and pattern recognition vision recognition dog knows where the food is you know etc et but can you generalize that can you move from coronal to axial to sagittal, rec recreate in your mind what it would look like and recognize it, okay? All right, we're not done. We're not done with this. It's a pituitary microadenoma. I want to know a more specific diagnosis. I'm going to show you another MR image, okay? And within the context, within the context of what I'm asking, I want you to tell me what type of microadenoma is it, right? And you're going to have to justify it. Okay, you ready? Now, the, the adenoma, of course, is not visible, of course, in this section. I'm sure I don't even have to say that. What, what type is it and why? What's a clue? So maybe uh, growth hormone? Uh, 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 tell me why. Uh, it looks like there's frontal bossing. Okay, I like that. That's good. That's good. Okay, I'll tell you, it's not, but I like that. See, now, you, this is good. That, that is excellent. Okay, but for, there is frontal bossing. It's not growth hormone. Keep going. You're on the right track. Something Cushing's. else. ACTH. Yeah. Cushing's, why? It's going to be the buffalo hump. Yes, is that Dr. Gilbert? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, exactly. The, buff, the redistribution of the fat, quote, buffalo hump. Exactly. Do you like that? Now, but see, I also like the frontal bossing for growth hormone because it, it, you got out. You got out of the brain. So everyone that was looking at the brain, clear, clearly, that's not where the answer is for pituitary micro. micro it's, that everything in the brain for the microadenoma is in the cella, right? It had to be outside. So I like. I like that. Yes. Uh, this is this is a corticotroph uh, microadenoma. Exactly. Do you like that? Yeah. Now, now you could say, well, well, this could be obesity. Yes, it, of course it could be just, just obesity or whatever, but that's why I said in the context of a pituitary microadenoma, there is a clue here. So in the di listen, in the differential diagnosis for this, quote, buffalo hump or that fat, in the differential diagnosis would be just simply obes obesity or just, just, just normal. And you would have to think Cushing's. Could it be Cushing's? Cushing's due to, all right, an adenoma or an ACTH-dependent Cushing's. Yeah, good. Okay, um, let's go keep moving here. Uh, MR image of the week. This is what I chose as the MR image. You'll have to admit, this is pretty striking. No? Uh, anyone want to hazard a guess what it is? I think I think it's not really 
quite fair. But you, you, you I mean, uh, can you? Uh, how about not? Not guess what it is. That, that's not. Can anyone want to create a differential diagnosis? Just a differential. Okay, I'm not a neuroradiologist, but I'm going to have a go. It looks like it's it might be almost developmental because it looks like it's sort of arising out of the of the parenchyma there, but I'm uh -huh. totally guessing. I don't know what it is. Okay, that's good. Thank, thank you. Thank you for playing. No, no, that, that, that takes courage. All right, here, when, when you say out of the parenchyma, that would probably be on the left side low, you know, the left, that, uh, left side low. But if you look at the part that's crossing the midline over to the right side, can you see the cortical ribbon, how it's being displaced, it's being pushed away? Yeah. That's, yeah, that speaks to an extra axial mass. So this actually is an extra axial mass. Uh, okay, so w within that context, what what's the differential? I right, tell you what, hang on, let's go. Up, let's let's segue directly into the imaging composite of the week, which is this case, right? Let me show you more images. There you go. Uh, anyone, one of the one of the uh, I don't know if Ta Octavio's uh, on board or one of our neuroradiologists want to unmute and just describe what these sequences are. Okay, I can do it. It's, you've got you've got T1's post at the top. Uh, you've got a, a T2 on the right. Uh, then at the bottom, there's a diffusion ADC and then an axial post contrast. You've got an enhancing uh, mass with some uh, areas in the middle that are a little heterogeneous. They're either cystic or necrotic. Uh, it does look like an extra axial mass. It does look like that it is involving the dura. Absolutely. That, th thank you, Dr. Singh. That, that was masterful. And the, uh, the DWI and the ADC map are showing it's complex because of, 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 of the cystic areas, but it is, it is restricting diffusion. All right. So you've got that. Um, anyone want to venture a differential? That's a beautiful description. Venture, venture a differential diagnosis. And now I'm going to show you the histology. Differential diagnosis. Atypical meningioma. I like atypical meningioma. What would you call the sign if it's an atypical meningioma? The What's mushrooming it? sign. Mushroom yes, sign. mushrooming sign, exactly, which could be atypical or anaplastic. Now, this doesn't look quite as bad. It doesn't look quite as bad. Anaplastics typically are super ugly. I mean, really ugly. We've shown them in this conference before. I love atypical meningioma. Now, listen, listen. Anytime that you think atypical meningioma to this degree, what we're seeing here, yeah. Anytime you think atypical meningioma, there's another entity you must you must put right behind it. We've said many times, in the context of what you think by, on imaging is gliomatosis cerebri, you always have to keep in mind lymphomatosis cerebri. It is vanishingly rare compared to gliomatosis, but it mimics gliomatosis virtually perfectly, and you must think about it. So what you would say is, this looks like gliomatosis cerebri, but a rarer possibility could be lymphomatosis cerebri, right? You have to at least know about it, you have to think about it. So in this context, when you're thinking, because of this mushrooming, right, which is differential centers of proliferation, heterogeneous cell proliferation, different clones growing at different rates gives the lumpy bumpy instead of the beautiful smooth convex interface for, of, a, of a grade one meningioma. Anytime you're thinking atypical meningioma, what is the other entity that you must, you must think of, must include in your differential? Just below it. It's rarer, but just below it. What? Solitary fibrous tumor. Solitary fibrous tumor. Yes, it, 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 exactly. Okay, we got one from the old school hemangiopericytoma, and we got one from the new era solitary fibrous tumor, and we're about to address, we're go, we, we are going to address that right now. Good job. Here's the histology. What is it? Higher power. Higher power. Yeah, absolutely solitary fibrous tumor. Yes. You like that? Always, if you're thinking atypical meningioma because of the mushrooming, add, add in the same breath, or solitary fibrous tumor. And we're going, listen, we're going to adopt the new, the new WHO fifth edition. WHO 2021 convention, I'll talk about it in just a second. Hemangiopericytoma, I think, is finally going to sunset. We have been using both terms for about five years now, since the WHO 2016 came out. I think we're going to finally sunset 
hemangiopericytoma. All right, there we go. You can see these, maybe they almost look like whorls, but poorly, poorly formed whorls. That's what hemangiopericytoma frequently looks like. Uh, sometimes they're, they're uh, uh, patulant, gaping, all right, like this. Now, look, look in, in the very center. Do you see the, uh, uh, the, the, the vessel? It's being deformed by a pseudo whorl, a primitive whorl to the left of it. See how it's, the whorl is kind of bulging in? That is highly characteristic of solitary fibrous tumor. And the vascular pattern here, it's highlight, highlighted uh, with the smooth muscle, uh, smooth muscle actin, is frequently called staghorn. Stag would be uh, the, the, the male deer, you know, the antlers and how they branch. Right, that staghorn and how they curve. They branch, they also curve. That, that was the, the, that's the, the traditional buzzword, if you will, in path lingo for, for, for this. And it's these whorls, these whorls pushing into the vessel, which are creating the curvature of the staghorn vessels. And this is just a little bit uh, higher power. Look, right in the center, you see the sort of whorl, et cetera. Uh, you can see exactly the same thing uh, with a CD34, which is highlighting the vasculature here. Shows the same thing. It highlights the vasculature uh, when sometimes you can't see it on H and E so clearly. Now CD34 is also important. The reason why we used it historically is because in solitary fibrous tumor grade one, which is the historic old solitary fibrous tumor, it tends to be strongly diffusely positive. In the old hemangiopericytoma or solitary fibrous tumor grade two or grade three, it tends to be only patchy, sometimes sometimes stone cold negative. All right, that's what we said in the old days. We said it was purely negative. Then we got it doesn't have to be negative. It can be like this. So you can see in this particular tumor, it's patchy. See the blushy stuff? Let's go up to higher power. And you see in the center of the field, that staining is actually labeling the tumor cells themselves, not blood vessels. Here's an even better example. To the left is only the vessels labeled. Majority of the cells are negative. To the right, you see this beautiful labeling. That CD34 is highly characteristic of the solitary fibrous tumor spectrum, all right? But usually in SFT, it's not strongly diffuse. But it can be. It can be of, of any grade. I mean, it, it, okay, okay. All right, so historical markers. Historically, we ran three markers to diagnose or to provide support for solitary fibrous tumor slash hemangiopericytoma, CD34, CD99, and BCL2. We would run all three. Frequently, all three would be positive or patchy positive. That, that was, gave us support, immunophenotypic support for the diagnosis of um, solitary fibrous tumor hemangiopericytoma. Of course, today, it's STAT6. It's really the only marker you need. And what we're looking for is aberrant, aberrant nuclear translocation of STAT6. Or an aberrant nuclear expression of STAT6. It should be only in the cytoplasm. It's in the nuclei. That confirms the diagnosis. The, how, and, and you see the blood vessel, this Y, uh, you know, branching blood vessel in the center. All the endothelial cells serve as a negative control. So that's what you need to do. Let's say that uh, you know, every, everything, all the nuclei are brown. All right, you need to find an area with negative endothelia to make sure everything's just nonspecifically staining. This is something that pathologists know, right? You always have to have, have controls, that sort of thing. All right, the reason, question, question, how does the STAT6 get into the nucleus? And the answer is it's because it's fused with NAB2. And NAB2, that molecule, has a nuclear binding receptor to the nuclear membrane binding receptor, which transports it across the nuclear membrane into the nucleus. And so what we're doing is we're hooking STAT6 up to NAB2, and NAB2, it, it's just like a tractor trailer, you know, the big tractor trailers with the box cars, that's that sort of thing. Uh, it's the engine, NAB2 is the engine that drives, if, if you will, STAT6 into the nucleus. That's how it works. All right, so here, uh, here we go. Solitary fibrous tumor reduction grade three. All right, note, listen, note. In the forthcoming uh, fifth edition, 2021, these diagnoses will be officially discouraged. Th that's a, as of the last draft I saw. Yeah, all kinds of changes may be made by the final edit editorial group, but, but I think this is what it's going to be. Solitary fibrous tumor slash hemangiopericytoma and parenthesis uh, hemangiopericytoma. I think it's going to disappear, and that, that usage of combining them, you know, either separately or together, I think it's going to disappear, and we're going with this. Okay, because it's been five years. I think everyone knows now, right? And all the old guys have retired. <laughs> they couldn't accept it. <laughs> so it's solitary fibrous tumor, grade one, grade two, grade three. How did this get to grade three? Because it had five or more mitoses per 10 high power fields. All right, and that's gonna be defined as something around a single high power field, 0 0.23 um, uh, square millimeters. 
All right, and this one had eight, which is well into the grade three. Uh, here's the comment. Uh, H. Stain stains section show high-grade mesenchymal neoplasm, turbulent store form architecture, prominent vasculature, branching staghorn powder, best appreciate on SMA. I could have added CD34, should have, doesn't matter. Mitotic activity is conspicuous up to eight mitoses for 10 high-power fields. All right, 10 times 0 0.23 is 2.3 uh, square millimeters. The, we, the WHO fifth edition 2020 is encouraging everyone to define the high-power field. Right, oh, exactly what it is. Uh, it's a, a simple ca calibration of, uh, of your microscope. Most of them, most my, it varies. That's why they're saying that I quote high power field. This is what it's going to be in most microscopes. Are very close to 2.2, 2.3, something like that. All right. Uh, differentiation marker immunophenotyping. This is H and E first paragraph. Differentiation marker second paragraph. Molecular signature third paragraph. Correlation with imaging, fourth paragraph. That is a typical format of my comment, my reports. Differentiation marker immunophenotyping for foreign foreign institution shows multiple expression CD34 consistent with solitary fibrous tumor. Molecular signature determination for foreign foreign institution via surrogate immunophenotyping shows aberrant nuclear expression of STAT6 confirming the diagnosis of solitary fibrous tumor. All right, the degree of elevated mitotic activity warrants assignment to WHO grade three, formally termed anaplastic hemangiopericytoma. So there it is. All right, there's a an homage, a nod to the past. <laughs> I'll put it, I'll put it in the I'll put it in the comment. The diagnosis of SFT grade three congruent with pre-op CT and MR imaging studies, which show large left parafiles on durabase, cystic and solid, contrast enhancing, diffusion restricting, multi-lobulated mass that exerts marked mass effect. Do you see how e how easy that sentence reads? Look at all those modifiers of mass. Mass Mass is the target noun. How can you read that so easily and understand without even a single comma? Because of the hyphens. This is called hyphenating multiple modifiers of a single noun. So dura-based, cystic and solid, that would be like round to oval, you know, that you could hyphenate it. Contrast enhancing, diffusion restrict restricting, multilobulated. That reads really easily. There's no way you could misconstrue it, right? And I didn't even use a comma. That's the power of punctuation. In this case, the power of a hyphen. The point of punctuation is that, that so someone can read your prose, someone can read what you have written, and it's like they're hearing you speak it with all of the natural pauses, all right? So a big pause, that's a period, or the, as the Brits would say, a full stop. Comma, uh, uh, okay, next would be semicolon, would be not as long as a period, but it's so long, then a comma, all right, ellipsis, et cetera, et cetera, right? The, the hyphens also. So we're taught punctuation is for clarity, right, as well as, as for reading. All right, I felt compelled to say that. Okay, I think, I think we, are, we are warmed up. We've got about 17 minutes. Um, I got a couple of patients we're going to cover. Patient number one, 36-year-old male, all right? Uh, Sanjay, if, if you're, you're, you want to unmute and describe it, if you're still on the line. Sanjay, uh, Dr. Singh is also also reading out. I'll tell you, okay, this is CT, sagittal axial coronal CT, really large mass, it's either cyst or necrosis. All right, let's moving on. Okay, upper two panels, uh, what you have is, is, is the T2 and T2 flare, immediately below those, T1, T1 with contrast. The single in the middle is a gradient T2 gradient echo, which shows essentially uh, no hemorrhage, no, no, no calcification. Uh, on the far right top is diffusion weighted imaging. Look at the cap, the very top, the most rostral in the, in the frontal area of the cyst. See how uh, hyper intense it is on the, on the DWI. And then if you go down to the bottom, just below it, that is the apparent diffusion coefficient map, the ADC map. You see how that bright signal is now dark hypo intense that confirms that it, there's no t that, that the hyper intensity on the dwi is not t2 shine through it is restricting diffusion okay all right and let's look at the histology i got several panels let's take that in here's another area here's another area one more okay all right somebody would someone like to unmute and give me a diagnosis, or what is at the top of your differential diagnosis? Cystic glioblastoma. Yes, yeah, cystic glioblastoma, <laughs> absolutely. IDH mutant or IDH wild type? Um, IDH wild type. Okay, absolutely. Absolutely. And you say that probably because of this ugly, horrendous histology, all right? All right? 
Now, this is a composite that I put together, you know, a year ago or so of a series of MD Anderson, 10 different patients with cystic. So that is not necrosis in center. That is, that is actually a cyst. It's fluid with protein. Uh, cystic, IDH wild type, glioblastoma, all of these confirmed, 10 patients, all right? And you can see this is essentially, have, it's a ring enhancing, a rim enhancing cyst with a thick, bulky, uh, you know, mural component which is the mass of the tumor, right? But our patient is not like these. The imaging is identical. The imaging is identical. But what is this marker? What do you think it is? IDH? Yes, ma'am. That's right, Dr. Gilbert. This is IDH. Well, it's technically IDH R132H yeah, R1 mutant protein. You can see the negative of vascular proliferation at the top. This is IDH mutant disease. No kidding. No kidding. That's why we have to run the marker. We run the marker on all cases. This is just another area. All right, P53. Essentially, 100% of the cells staining, that is certainly, almost certainty, to be TP53 mutation. All right, this is just another area, 100%. And this is the ATRX lost in the tumor cells. You can see retained in the endothelial cells, two, two or three vessels over to the right, the scattered labeled nuclei. Some of them may be tumor cells. It's not 100% loss typically. Most of those are going to be uh, glia, you know, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, neurons, micro microglia, loss of ATRX. That is the classic triad. Here's just another area of IDH mutant disease. All right, so outside case. Here's the diagnosis, astrocytoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade four by the C-Impact Now, WHO CNS 5E 2021 nomenclature. We, I'm, I'm including, I'm including, but in lower font, we're gonna try to de-emphasize it, the old WHO 2016 glioblastoma, IDH mutant, WHO grade four, it will help, it will qualify the patients for glioblastoma trials, which simply require glioblastoma in the diagnosis and do not differentiate between IDH mutant and IDH wild type. Those trials are receding, they're still running, but they are receding and molecular signature based, all right, stratification of patients, those trials are incoming, right? Many, many already coming. In the future, we will almost certainly, we will almost certainly separate these because you're vitiating, you are vitiating the patient pool when you mix IDH mutant disease, well, grade four disease with IDH wild type disease. But this is a good way to handle it for right now, and we could even continue that for a very little amount of time after the 5E comes out. All right, and then here's the data. Notice I am following the convention. Human proteins, the abbreviation, the gene abbreviations are capitalized, but not italicized. That's the protein. Genes are capitalized and italicized. All right, and you can see I follow the convention. You follow the convention, it gives you two different ways. Now, I did say protein, right? I wrote protein. I did not have to do that technically, right, because it's not italicized in the convention, but it's just a safeguard, fine, all right? There's no possibility of ambiguity here, okay? All right, uh, this is something different. This is something different that I put in this particular report. Uh, per report, evaluation of molecular alterations via the Mayo Medical Labs Neuro-Oncology Expanded Gene Paddle with, with rearrangement has been requested, results are pending. And then I add this note, this next generation sequence platform composed of DNA subpanel tests for uh, alteration 118 genes and RNA subpanel for 81 genes, including 104 gene fusions, 28 known average transcripts. And then I put in the website. This is the website for, uh, for the test at Mayo Clinic Labs. Now, listen, full disclosure, I get the things I say, I think it, I may have said, you know, I record these conferences, so, you know, that, that sort of thing. I do not. I do not have any financial interest in, in the Mayo Clinic or in their laboratory. The point here is, is that why did I do that? I did this because this patient has not has, has had has had piecemeal testing. That's that's what you saw. Whoops, sorry. That's what you see here. This is piecemeal immunohistochemistry and some fish studies. That's all. This patient has not had comprehensive uh, in, in, NGS. What I'm doing is I'm telling the neuro oncologist exactly what has been done on the outside. This is true NGS. 
this means this means that we will be able probably to get a hold of this report and we do not have to repeat NGS at MD Anderson Cancer Center. That's it's the communication with the neuro oncologist, everything like that. Okay, that, that sort of thing. You can you can do anything you want in your path reports, in your radiology reports that helps the primary care physician, which means it helps the patient, right? Now look, brief digression about cystic glioblastoma. There's, there, we're we're going to get to the bottom line of, of this tumor in just a second. Let's do a brief digression. This is a paper that we published way back in uh, 2004, Cystic Glioblastoma Survival Outcomes 22 Cases. And you can recognize senior author, Dr. Dr. Sawaya, uh, other neurosurgeons here. You can see Dr. Lang and Dr. Prabhu. All right, and here's just a, a panel, uh, pre-op on top, post-op, gross total resection, which in glioblastoma is defined as removing all of the contrast-enhancing part. Uh, this, is, uh, this is overall survival, a trend towards increased survival of cystic glioblastoma, not statistically significant, but recurrence-free survival, absolutely um, uh, statistically significant, longer recurrence-free survival in cystic glioblastomas. Uh, we attributed that to um, a very narrow rim of infiltration, so that gross total resection probably also not just got the enhancing component, which would be the vascular proliferation of necrosis, but also probably got a majority or bulk of the dense disease out, and maybe, th maybe that's why. But now listen, here's the thing. Let's think about it. This is 2004, right? And we, and we got longer progression-free survival cystic glioblastoma. We based it on this. Well, I just showed you a case of IDH mutant cystic glioblastoma. Now, it's rare, that obviously, just, just like IDH wild type glioblastoma is much more common than secondary glioblastoma or de novo presentation IDH mutant glioblastoma. Is it possible that one of our, one of our 22 cases or, or more was IDH mutant? Sure, but 2004, we didn't know. And maybe, maybe that contributed to this longer progression-free survival. See, see, that's the way you need to think when you're evaluating older literature you always have to look at it in the context of what we know now. If we were to repeat the study of cystic glioblastoma, it would be mandatory, mandatory to have IDH testing, right? So, so we're not contaminating the study. That's how you think like a scientist in diagnostic medicine and when you evaluate literature. All right, let, let's, let's do the, 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 uh, the, the, the take home points uh, from the case study. Take home points. Number one, listen. IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic disease can present as a large monocystic mass with enhancing mural component, not a nodule. It's usually not a nodule. It's a component. All right. Mimicking IDH wild type cystic glioblastoma, which is usually going to be the case cystic glioblastoma is going to be IDH wild type. IDH mutant diffuse astrocytic disease can present as a densely cellular, highly mitotically active, ugly grade 4 tumor mimicking IDH wild type glioblastoma. The majority do not. The majority of grade 4 IDH mutant astrocytomas look look like grade two slash three diffuse astros and they will they will have foci nodular typically nodular foci of contrast enhancement which correspond to yes quote vascular proliferation but there's no dense hypercellularity necrosis pseudopalisading not that that would be the typical the typical grade four idh mutant disease diffuse astro, astro. But there are cases like this at initial presentation that look horrendous, all right? There, there are multiple potential reasons for that. Sometimes if it's through evolution, I mean, you know, over time, it could be temozolomide-induced hypermutator phenotype. Those tumors, once they acquire the hypermutation over time and all that, they look like horrendous IDH wild-type glioblastoma. This case, I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, you could postulate uh, CDKN2AB homozygous deletion, which it was adverse. Okay, that's probably part of the story. There may be, there may be others. We, we are absolutely going to sequence uh, uh, this, and if I, if I have meaningful data, I'll bring it back to you. Here's the point. IDH mutant disease can, in some instances, be as ugly as IDH wild type. Run the markers, and ideally, do PCR, run the NGS. All right, you like that? Okay, here's another point, separate. Neoplastic mimics can replicate features in two or three of the data spheres. What, hap what happened in this case? What happened in this case is on the imaging, the pre-op imaging, this IDH mutant tumor mimicked IDH wild type cystic glioblastoma. And then on the histology, on the H&E histology, another data sphere, histologic features, this IDH mutant diffuse astro mimicked IDH wild type glioblastoma. All right, so mimics can do this, and it can be the other way around, right? Usually, usually it's, it's the aggressive tumor mimicking a benign tumor, right? Mimics can in two or three spheres, but never in all eight. Never in all eight. That's why we didn't misdiagnose 
this case, as IDH wild type, glioblastoma, never in all eight. Work the model. Use the model. Populate the spheres. You need all eight spheres. Okay, in this particular case, the molecular signature, obviously. Molecular signature said unequivocally that this is IDH mutant disease. Now, might, th might this IDH mutant diffuse astro have a worse prognosis? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and I think probably does. Just like the CDKN2AB homozygous deleted IDH mutant diffuse astros, I think so, but maybe for you know, for, 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 for a different reason, for sure. But, but its name is still IDH mutant diffuse ast astrocytoma IDH mutant devitro grade 4. Okay? You got that? All right. Diagnosis will be in the center. Okay, let, let's talk about patient number two. I know we only have five minutes. This is really an important case, and we're going to finish this conference. Patient, patient number two. All right, here's the imaging. I don't know if we have a, a neuroradiologist that would like to unmute quickly and describe it quickly, and if not, I will. So I had to. Oh yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, no, uh, there's a posterior fossa uh, mass enhancing mass, uh, kind of a rising. Uh, inferior to the foramen and uh, with this single image uh, I would include in the differential diagnosis an ependymoma and a subependymoma. Beautiful. Magnificent. Thank you. That was perfect. Exactly. It's, in ri it's arising from the floor of the inferior, the caudal, caudal part floor of the fourth ventricle, ependymoma, subependymoma. All listen, listen, listen. In the fourth ventricle, all subependymomas arise inferior or caudal to the stria medullaris in the caudal half, right? Yes, and you, you need you need to know that, right? Okay. So what we're seeing here, I'll just I'll just say you can see multiple seeding seeding of the CSF. Left meningeal disease, bulky disease. All right. So all, all of this is is, is is a metastatic tumor. Let's look at the histology. One panel, second panel. What's the diagnosis? Someone unmute and give me the diagnosis. Ependymoma. Yes, perivascular pseudo rosettes, ependymoma, done and done and done. Okay, all right. Now let's look at the molecular signature. Ready? Here's the molecular signature. Oh, TERT. Let's look at the details, section immediately below this. Oh, wow. It is one of the two canonical TERT promoter mutations. So C minus 124, that means it's 124 uh, base pairs uh, 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 pre, pre uh, the coding region, uh, pre the start codon. All right. The two, listen, listen, the two canonical TERT promoter mutations that, that they're seeing, all, all tumors essentially, one, minus 124 CDT, minus 124, minus 146, also known as C. 228T and C250T, respectively. All right, those are going to go. Hmm, okay, interesting. Okay, what? Knowing that, listen, listen, listen. Knowing that, what might have been the ontogeny, the life, the life history, if you will, of this particular poster fossa, anaplastic ependymoma? What might have been its life his history? When was it born? What was it born as? How did it grow up to eventually seed the cerebral spinal fluid with drop metastases going all the way down the spinal cord. Anybody know? Well, here's the key. The origin from the floor of the fourth ventricle caudal to stria medullaris. Okay, I, I, put, I put a parallel line here running across, across the lower ponds showing like the rostral end of this tumor. It's clearly originated in the caudal half, right? So what brain tumor originates from the floor of the fourth ventricle caudal to stria medullaris? Or subependymoma. Huh. Okay, could this tumor have originated uh, in a subependymoma? Well, okay, what data might suggest that this anaplastic ependymoma may have originated from a subependymoma? What data? What data that we have? This data, TERP promoter mutation. Based on what? Based on a paper that came out three months ago. Inactive neuropathologic, a high-impact journal. TERP promoter mutation and chromosome 6 loss define a high-risk subtype of ependymoma evolving from posterior fossa subependymoma. All right? Now, listen. Let's look at this paper. They had 24 mixed ependymoma subependymomas. 24 patients with a posterior fossa 
ependymal group, which means ependymoma, subependymoma, ependymal group tumor identified. How did, how did they identify them as mixed ependymoma, subependymoma? By histology? No. By DNA methylation profiling. Some of these, listen, some of these tumors were pure histologic ependymoma. Some were pure subependymoma. All all of them by DNA methylation profiling, which can separate ependymoma from subependymoma from mixed ependymoma, subependymoma. All of them were mixed ependymoma, subependymoma. And for those that were for those that mixed, all right, look at the look at the percentages of subependymoma of these 24 tumors. Now you can see those that, that first five or six, those are going to look like pure subependymoma, right? They're going to have to look hard to find any ependymoma. The ones to the far right, they're going to look like pure ependymoma, but they all have the same methylation profiling, all right? And here's the, here's the, here's the map, the methylation profiling map, and everything that's labeled in red are, are the ependymoma group tumors. So you can see at the very top, ependymoma, rel-A fusion, you know, or, uh, positive. Uh, th then you can see uh, a spinal cord subependymoma, SBSE, supratentorial subependymoma, ependymoma YAP1, all right, all, all altered, uh, posterior fossa A, posterior fossa B, uh, ependymoma mixopathylary ependymoma, MPE, and finally ependymoma subependymoma. Now look at the posterior fossa, posterior fossa subependymoma box. Let's expand it. This is the group that we're looking, the group of patients of this study. Me DNA methylation profiling defined, and you can see that by histology, subependymoma mixed, subependymoma dominant, if you will, mixed tumor, ependymoma dominant, or for, and then a pure, a, a pure ep ependymoma. And you see they're, they're all clustering here. All right, now look at the genetics. For those tumors that look like subependymoma histologically, notice several of them have the TERP promoter mutation. As we move into the mixed tumors, what pops up? That's the chromosome 6 loss in, in the top, all right? That, that, that's chromosome number variation. That's the 6 loss. All right, in addition to a bunch of them have, have, have the TERP promoter mutation. And then for those mixed ependymoma, subependymoma, by DNA methylation profiling that are pure ependymoma by histology, all of them had loss of six and a TERP promoter mutation. Furthermore, if you micro dissect, these are four cases with micro dissected the two components, micro dissect the components, and look at the ependymoma is on the right. Those are, that's the only component that showed loss of six and some of them to TERP promoter mutation, like the, bo the bottom two cases. The subependymoma histology did not have those alterations, right? Okay, let's look at this, eight Venn diagram sphere. We're working, listen, we're working this hypothesis that our current patient, all right, this, this ependymoma, anaplastic ependymoma that's seeded to CSF, we're, we're examining the hypothesis that it may have evolved from a subependymoma, all right? I say we need to populate the sphere. Age, could age help us? Could age help us? Could it provide support or, or argue against this tumor rising? Yes, well, yeah. In the present scenario, what we're considering, what patient age would support origin from anaplastic ependymoma? Like if I were to tell you uh, this is a six-year-old child, would, would that support the hypothesis of evolution from subependymoma? Okay, well, it's, the answer is 60-something. The patient's, you know, 60, 65, 66. That would support the hypothesis. It wouldn't prove it, of course, but that's why we populate all of the spheres. We're looking for uh, we're looking for coalescence, convergence of the data, the overlapping Venn diagrams. That's why we work the model. All right, here it is from the paper. Look at the median age. All right, of those tumors of, the, of those tumors that were pure subependymoma, they tend to be about 50 years old. The mixed, all of the unequivocal mixed tumors. Mm, roughly 55, that was the average of this particular study, and the tumors that were pure ependymoma, but with the DNA methylation profiling signature of mixed 67 years old. So it appears to be an evolution. All right, th this is reasoning from the data. The epigenetic changes, all right, that's a DNA methylation profiling, is constant, right, that they're all that. But the, look at the genetic alterations, TERP promoter mutation and chromosome 6 loss increase as we go from histologic pure subependymoma to mixed tumor to ependymoma, and the risk of recurrence also increases as we move towards ependymoma. All right, let's look at the, 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 the important things in terms of, of survival, all right, survival probability. Gross total resection obviously does better than subtotal resection. Uh, ependymoma versus mixed versus subependymoma, ependymoma does the worst. That's, that's histology. All right, TERP promoter wild type, TERP, TERP promoter mutation. Look at that curve. Oh, man, how powerful is that TERP promoter mutation? Like our patient has. Our patient has a TERP promoter mutation. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it came from subependymoma or not. Okay, and then chromosome 6 loss, exactly like TERP promoter mutation. 
progression-free survival in 49 posterior fossa subependymoma sub tumors. Subtotal resection, pure ependymoma morphology, TERP promoter mutation, and chromosome 6 loss are significantly associated with reduced progression-free survival in posterior fossa subependymoma tumors. All right, abstract. We're going to go through this, through this quickly. We're going to finish up in about two minutes. Subependymomas are benign, benign tumors, posterior fossa, show unique genetic, uh, uh, distinct genetic profiles in the subependymoma posterior fossa group by the recently established DNA methylation based classification seen as tumors. In contrast, posterior fossa ependymomas are more aggressive, right? And we classify them into PFA or PFB. A subset of ependymomas show epigenetic similarities to subependymomas, but we haven't understood them. We therefore set out to figure it out. On histomorphology, uh, of the DNA methylation profiling group, 12 looked like histologic ependymomas, 14 were subependymomas, and 24 were mixed. All right, that's the whole group. All right, mixed ependymomas, subependymoma tumors varied in extent. All right, and we saw the curve, curve on that, but they all had the global epigenetic signature of poster fossa, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yada, yada, yada. All right. Then the, there's the microdissection, and then here's loss of chromosome 6 and TERP promoter were frequently enriched in pure subependymoma morphology. Look at that p-value. And confined to the areas of ependymal differentiation. Pure subependymoma phenotype, chromosome 6 loss, TERP mutation, shorter progression-free survival. In conclusion, our results suggest that subependymomas... Born, born a subependymoma may acquire genetic and epigenetic changes throughout tumor evolution over time if they're not resected, giving rise to subclones with ependymoma morphology, what you would you call that a mixed tumor, that eventually uh, overpopulate the subependymoma uh, component. What would you call that? Well, that would be a pure posterior fossa uh, subependymoma ependymomas. <laughs> Yes, so that is that that's the evolution. So everyone got that? So the concept is some of these aggressive ependymomas uh, of the poster fossa which seed the CSF like our patient actually arose from, uh, arose from subependymomas. All right, how cool is that? And we have two signatures, loss of chromosome 6 and ter the classical TERP promoting mutation, which is going to predict this aggressive behavior. Okay, if you did not know that aggressive posterior fossa ependymoma can arise from posterior fossa subependymoma through the subclonal acquisition of TERP promoting mutation and loss of chromosome 6, you are not yet a mature diagnostic medicine, uh, medicine physician. Join the club, neither am I, and we never will be. <laughs> and you must continue to attend the MDA. CC, IDMCC. All right, the good news. Next conference, June 25th, 6 a.m. And with that, uh, I will close the conference. My, uh, my apologies for running seven minutes over, but I think it was worthwhile. Thanks to everyone who attended, and I will see all of you on the 25th. Thank you, right, and, Thank you. Oh. Thank right, you, Dr. Thank Fuller. You. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Dr. Fuller. Hello.